identify poor or limited coordination of government interventions, as well as the non-enforcement of key legislation that have been enacted. There is further a lack of consequence management for institutions which are failing to advance gender transformation. A call was made that we must harness and strengthen partnership with all key stakeholders in the fight against gender discrimination, while ensuring that we improve coordination across all spheres of government. The oversight role of the legislative sector must be strengthened by building strategic partnerships across party political lines and with civil society organizations. Importantly, women's voices must also be heard. The progress we make towards the attainment of a democratic society can only have full and deeper meaning if it is accompanied by significant progress in the struggle for the emancipation of women. It therefore means we must be deliberate and consistent in our commitment to create platforms for regular engagement. These platforms must be spaces for robust oversight, robust oversight action plans so as to ensure measurable progress and impact in advancing gender equality. As a long-term implementation project, the advancement of gender equality and equity in South Africa will gain significant traction more so if the institutional arrangements and mechanisms that pertain to the national gender machinery are improved and given clear objectives and priorities to focus on across the three spheres of government. We have embarked on this massive program of, of reviewing the Women's Charter and we have realized that in many instances where while we are represented as women in different positions and at different platforms, we are just not making enough headway to ensure that there is gender equality and gender equity, but also that we address the plight of women where they are. We have particularly experienced issues with regards to the issues of rural women and women in traditional areas. It is the issues that we still need to make a lot of effort to address and to make sure that we, as the legislators and also as government, respond to the issues that will make sure that we have a just and an equal society. With that, I want to thank you, Honorable Nguita, for the opportunity to give a kind of perspective with regards to the work that we have done to make sure that we listen to the women of South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair, for quite a clear uh, conceptualization of the exercise that we are doing. Can I then, without wasting time, quickly call Mr. Nell Rue, State South Africa, to take us through his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I just want to quickly share the um, presentation, if you don't mind. Um, yes. There you go. And here we go. So let me just get to the beginning. There you go. Is it visible to everybody? Very clear. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yes, thank you uh, very much, ma'am, for asking Statistics South Africa to present this um, presentations again. Um, it's a very interesting presentation today in the sense that we are talking about three provinces at the same time. Uh, Eastern Cape, of course, Northwest and um, Gauteng provinces, which are very similar provinces in, in, in many regards. Um, as always, we just start with um, the population size of South Africa, which is, of course, almost 60 million people as of the middle of this year, 59.6 million people. Now, if you distribute it, uh, look at the distribution across provinces, we see that Gauteng is the largest province. Uh, about one in four people in South Africa reside in Gauteng. Uh, or 15.5 million people. Then you find the Eastern Cape as the fourth largest province at about 6.7 million people. That's about 11% of the total population. And Northwest is one of the smaller provinces. I think it's the third smallest province of about 4.1 million people, which makes it just under 7% of the total um, population. Just coincidentally, if you have a look at the three largest provinces, which is Gauteng, KZN, and Western Cape, um, they make up 
together and make up about 60% of the total population, uh, which shows you that the South African population are to a large extent uh, congregated in the, in the three provinces, the largest uh, metropolitan areas. Um, the sex distribution of a population is, uh, is, is very interesting and also quite important uh, in the sense that it gives you a sense of um, how migration patterns are happening and also about the age structure of that particular um, population. Now, if you have a look at the Eastern Cape, the Eastern Cape is the only population where um, male population makes up less than 50% of the total population, if you compare it to Gauteng and, and Northwest. And those of you that attended the sessions that we did in the Eastern Cape, uh, would remember that we said that that's really due to the out-migration, which is still highly selective of, of males, although the, the process is changing and females are also becoming more, much more uh, migratory. Gauteng is very equal. It's about 50% for males and 50% for females. Um, but to a large extent, this also reflects the fact that many male migrants in particular uh, choose Gauteng as their destination areas. Uh, Northwest province, of course, largely driven by um, migration into the Rustenburg area, where, of course, mines are also pre-selecting males to a large extent. So both Gauteng and Northwest, highly selective of male migrants in particular, and Eastern Cape, a largely male uh, migrant sending um, province. Of course, this will also have um, uh, impact on your age structure. And if you have a look at this age structure, uh, we'll notice if we go to the bottom rank, and that's the Gauteng rank, we'll see that about 67% of the total population of Gauteng are youth and adults. That's people 15 years to about 60 years of age. Those are people in their working ages. And of course, also um, that population group is um, filled on by migrants from other places, either who migrate to Gauteng for working purposes or for um, uh, looking for education and other purposes. At the same time, we'll also see that, and that's the orange little orange bar, that about 8.5% of the Gauteng population are over 60 years of age. Now, this slide is probably misleading in a sense that 8.5% seems small compared to others, but of course, because the Gauteng province is one of the largest provinces, it also implies that it's probably a larger share, a larger number of people. Um, if we have a look at Northwest province, uh, we can see also that um, people over 60 are about 9% of, of the total population. Um, however, we now start seeing that the uh, number of children is about, uh, contributes about a third of the total population. That's much higher than the 25% in Gauteng, for instance. And it starts telling you a story um, about higher fertility, but also people being sent back to the so-called rural areas to be looked after by family and extended families and so forth, grandmothers and, and the like. Eastern Cape, uh, we find that, and this is a very interesting, Eastern Cape has got a highest percentage of um, elderly, 60 years and older, at about 11.4%, and the second highest percentage of children um, under the age of 15, at about 36.6%, but also inversely the lowest percentage of youth and adults. And this is, of course, reflective of the impact of migration, uh, people moving out and uh, more elderly staying behind because the people who migrate are normally younger. But also to a large extent, it reflects the fact that many children are sent back to um, rural areas to live with grandparents and, and extended family members. Of course, that extends the, the burden of looking after children and extended families, often in, in this case, one of the poorest provinces in, in the country. So one of the ways in which we can... Uh, reflect the impact of this is looking at um, the living circumstances of children. Now, if you have a look again at Gauteng, we'll find that only about 10.8% of children lived with neither their mothers, mothers or fathers, about 37% lived with both their parents, uh, well, lived with the mother, and then 48%, almost half of all children lived with um, both their parents. So, it's a, um, the, the picture is completely different if you have a look, for instance, at Northwest Province, where you find that 20%, that's one-fifth of all children lived with neither their parents, 46%, um, almost 50% lived with only a mother, and only 50% lived with um, both. And then, of course, if you look at Eastern Cape at the bottom, the picture is completely different, where you see that 33%, one in three children lived with neither their parents, and 40% uh, lived with um, a mother. Now, I think it's very important just to emphasize here that a living arrangements shouldn't be normative. Um, you know, we're not necessarily using the, um, 
the core family um, ideal you know that comes from from middle class uh, you know America or Europe as necessarily the ideal where to strive for but I think it is important to emphasize that children needs to live uh, children that lives with both their parents or children that live in, in families where there's a sizable income normally have much better um, living chances you know they can go to better schools they can um, learn um, you know more social social norms and morals and so on uh, so this is an important slide just in, in in that regard and of course the other thing in the eastern cape is it also just re-emphasizes the fact that many children are raised by um, family members and particularly female family members, particularly older family members. So with that in mind, it's therefore important to have a look at um, where these income sources comes from. And this is one of the first slides that we're gonna have a look at. And if you have a look at the um, Eastern Cape slide, we'll find that about 48.9% of uh, female headed households, um, that's almost one half of all female headed households, didn't have a single employed uh, member in that particular household. Um, as you'll see in a later slide, most of these households were dependent on grants and remittances to look after the children in those, in those, slide, in the, in those households. Another thing that we don't show here, but we, which is um, very important, I think, to take note of, is that um, households in Eastern Cape and Northwest are generally also much larger than those in Gauteng um, because it contains more children and older people and, and other uh, individuals. Uh, if you have a look at the Northwest, the same percentage is about 46%. And that's, of course, uh, much, much higher than the percentage you find in Gauteng, which is only about 29%. I think the important thing here, though, is to compare the percentage of males and females that don't have, or the female headed households that doesn't have a um, employed member with their male counterparts. And as you can see, in all three respects, in both Gauteng as well as Eastern Cape and Northwest, uh, male headed, female headed households are much more likely um, to not contain a working individual compared to their male um, counterparts. Uh, even in Gauteng province, uh, although the percentage is much, much lower than that in the Eastern Cape, Northwest and, and Limpopo, uh, you'll find that the percentage is still 28.8% for females compared to only about 13% um, for males. And, and that shows a, a very, very clear distinction and shows that something is, 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 is clearly wrong that needs to be addressed. Now, I think this is also a very important slide in, in a sense that it shows that in the Northwest, um, females and only, oh, I'm sorry, and 75% of the men's median uh, monthly earnings in 2018, and that was lower than the figures for Eastern Cape and, and Gauteng. Um, for the Eastern Cape, you can see they earned about 85.7%, uh, Gauteng 81.6%, and the Northwest only 75%. The best that we had in South Africa was Western Cape, which is about 87%. And then uh, just for context, the worst was in, in Limpopo, which about 66.2%. That, of course, says something about the uh, equality of work and, and, and earnings that, that goes with it. That is also something that, of course, is very important to um, address. Uh, those of you that have followed the news would, would know that um, we had a quarterly labor force survey was, was published yesterday, um, quarter three, and we found that the Eastern Cape reported the un official unemployment rate of 45.8%, which was much higher than Gauteng at about 337 and Northwest at 28.3%. Um, and uh, you can see uh, um, the Eastern Cape, the uh, extended pop, um, unemployment rate was even higher than that, and that was 51.2%, which makes it one of the highest. And then of Gauteng, um, from the three provinces we're looking at, that was probably the, the lowest. Of course, um, for South Africa as a whole, that was about 33.1%, which is uh, means that essentially one in three people were officially unemployed, and almost one in two people, um, if you take 43%, were, were also looking for, for work. Now, looking at the lower bound poverty lines, and of course, this is to a large extent affected by unemployment. Um, we find that 59% of the Eastern Cape population was, was considered poor. Um, that is slightly higher than the 47%, or well, it's sizably higher, but it's uh, the 47% of Northwest, and that's a lot higher than the 19% that we find in Gauteng. Now, of course, if you remember back, if we go to the previous slide, um, you would remember that Gauteng, um, 
probably also did much better in terms of um, unemployment rates than, than many, than, than the other two provinces. Now, just to remind you, the lower bound poverty line we're talking about is the amount of 840 rands per person per month that's required to um, obtain uh, food particularly and also other life essentials. Um, now, using the, um, this poverty line, um, I think it's also very important to note that in 2006, that poverty line started about 370 rands, and that has increased over the years to the current rate of about 840 rands in 2020, uh, usually adjusted by, by inflation. So that also, of course, means that um, over these years, um, the poverty and the percentage of households that fall under the poverty line has also been affected by this rate. Um, I think, however, it's very important for us to realize, particularly in a country like South Africa with very high unemployment rates and also a very large uh, rural, problem, uh, rural population, be they marginalized or not, is that South Africa's uh, health and well-being is not only dependent on their monetary income, in other words, how much income they earn from, from work, but also that it's affected by a whole range of issues, including the access to services they've got, access to education and various other um, issues that government provide for. Now, these are some of the issues that have then been used uh, to, do, to develop the South African Multiple um, Poverty Index. Uh, we're looking at health, and the index here that we're looking at is child mortality, because child are very susceptible to poor living conditions. Education, uh, years of schooling and school attendance, and then, of course, also living standards, which are affected here by whether people have got access to electricity for lighting, heating, cooking, uh, whether people have got access to water, improved sanitation, uh, whether they're living in decent housing, and also what kind of assets they have. And then, of course, the most important one of these is whether people are employment, whether they're employed and are able to bring in um, education or income, rather. Uh, looking at a sample for the three provinces um, that we have, uh, we can find here that the situation in Gauteng is, as one would expect, um, by far the, the best of the three. Um, this is for Northwest in the, in the right corner. We find that Northwest situation is slightly poorer than that for South Africa as a whole. Uh, in 2016, the sample was uh, measured about 8.8% compared to 7% for um, the country as a whole. Um, by com contrast, the Gauteng province was actually below the South African average, about 4.6% compared to 7%. Then, of course, the Eastern Cape, um, of the three provinces that we're looking at, the Eastern Cape had the highest um, score and, of course, also inversely the highest poverty rate. You'll see that in 2001 and 2011, uh, poverty, um, both using money metric, but in this case, the SAMPI, actually decreased in all three provinces uh, significantly. Um, however, it seemed to have done so slightly faster uh, in, in South Africa as a, as a whole. And that's largely because of the um, wealthier provinces um, who grew employment and, and income faster. This is just to show the, um, the share of the um, variables that we've looked at. Unemployment, as you can see, is by far the most important component of the sample, and that's then followed by years of schooling, sanitation, and, and the other ones in relatively equal measure. Now, source of income, I've mentioned earlier that salaries are, of course, extremely important in terms of um, uh, whether households are going to be poor or not. And if we have a look here, we can see that the three provinces that we're looking at, Eastern Cape, Northwest, and Gauteng, are completely different in uh, the types of income that households report. In Gauteng, 71% of all households reported that a salary or a wage was their main source of income. That's compared to about 53% in Northwest and only 43% in the Eastern Cape. Now, if we have a look at um, remittances, those are money that's sent um, to those families from outside the province or from other households, we find that remittance in the Eastern Cape was high at about 12%. That's very similar to what we find in Northwest, significantly higher than what we find in Gauteng, which is only 6%. Now, this, of course, to a large extent reflects the fact that migrants in Gauteng migrated there uh, for employment purposes, and they sent money away to other provinces and family and other places rather than necessarily receiving it themselves. In terms of social grants as a source of income, in Gauteng, only 9% of households um, reportedly received some kind of social grant, um, be it a child support grant, an alters grant, or, or any other disability grant, for instance, as, a, as the main source of income. 
But this compares uh, very well, and it's much lower than the 40 to 24 percent that you find in Northwest, and much much lower than the 35 percent that you find in, in Eastern Cape. And many of these uh, grants that you look at the 35 percent are old age grants and also child support grants. Now, the source of income here refers to having businesses. Um, you know, and, and running various other kinds of schemes. And here we can see that in Gauteng, many, many people, uh, a much larger percentage than in Northwest and, and Eastern Cape, uh, were actually involved in some kind of uh, income generating activities. Um, and of course, that is that is also a, um, in, indicative, of course, of the of the area in which they are with a higher population densities and wealth and, and so forth. Service delivery, of course, is one of the most important elements of the SAMPI. So here we can have a look at uh, access to improved sanitation. And we find that the three um, provinces that we're looking at is Gauteng, which is their um, the middle, the top line in the middle. Eastern Cape and Northwest, which are um, in the left-hand column, the bottom two. We can find here that, that Gauteng is consistently, of course, one of the more um, densely populated and also wealthier provinces in South Africa, has consistently been above the national average. Um, at about 91.8%. Um, and of course, as you can see, although the South African average has been um, increasing, the, the cutting average has always been significantly higher. In the Eastern Cape, there's been, in terms of access to sanitation, there's been a tremendous increase in households' um, access from 2002, when only about one third of households had access to food sanitation. That has increased to about 88%, which is very close to what you find for cutting. North West areas seems to be a bit of a straggler. Uh, we find here that there's been an increase from about 54% to 71% in 2018, but both lacks the, um, the South African average, but also it seemed to have stagnated um, lately. To a large extent, this is of course due to the fact that um, large majority of people live in a Rustenburg area, um, informal areas where services are not necessarily provided. So that's mostly because of population density issues. If we have a look at um, electricity connections, uh, again, Gauteng is the bottom right-hand corner, Eastern Cape is just above it, and Northwest is just in the first column on the bottom side. Um, Gauteng, of course, here we can actually see something very strange. We can see there's been a slight decline over the years from 87.2% to 77.2%, 78% .7 in Gauteng. And this is directly attributable to um, the large number and percentage of informal settlements uh, in, in Gauteng. High migration moving into that areas and individuals or the, the government unable to provide formal mains electricity. I think it's important here to also um, make the point that we're talking about mains electricity. So this is an official uh, link uh, to either ESCOM or municipal electricity. Um, if you just have a look at access to electricity by any means, whether it be uh, getting it from a neighbor or some, somebody else, the percentage is much, much higher. Now in Northwest, we can see also very similar over time um, that it's really been under average for South Africa. It's fluctuated a bit, but it started at 82% in 2002 and it ended up at about 84% in 2018. Um, again, also largely affected by um, high population densities and in, in and around Rustenburg area of the mines. Eastern Cape, a much better story. Um, there's been a tremendous increase from 2002 to uh, 2018, uh, where we find that about 87% of all households um, are um, electrified or have got access to mains electricity. Uh, if we have a look at vulnerable groups, of course, we all realize that females, um, both working young females, females looking for, for, for employment, and also older females who have retired and are looking after other family members, probably some of the most at risk uh, individuals. Just excuse me for a second, please. Um, and I think that the, the slides that we've shown thus far has probably um, emphasized this point. Uh, one of the ways in which females, of course, particularly those in rural areas, um, often uh, make a life is by getting involved in agriculture. Now, agriculture, um, as you can see in the poorest province, uh, which is the Eastern Cape, is actually also the largest share um, of, of households are involved there. About 
we see that female genital households are much more um, likely to, to, to suffer hunger. So they are much more vulnerable than um, your male genital households in general. And again, to a large extent, that is of course linked to employment and other various opportunities that, that females have. Um, this is the second last slide, ma'am. Um, and this deals with um, whether females have ever experienced sexual violence or whether they've ever experienced physical violence. At a provincial level, we find that um, unfortunately in Eastern, well, in the North, Northwest, perhaps you'll start with ever experienced sexual violence. About 12% of all females that participated said they've ever experienced sexual violence. That is higher than this percentage in Gauteng, which is about 8%, um, which is also slightly higher than that in, in Eastern Cape. Um, if this is not bad enough, um, if one have a look at whether people have ever experienced physical violence, we find that about one in three women in the Eastern Cape reported that they've ever experienced physical violence. And that's very similar to what you find in Northwest, which is also about 30%, if, if you allow me, one in, one in three, roughly speaking. And this is significantly higher than what you find in, in Gauteng. As I always do, I just re-emphasize the fact that these figures are indicative but they are probably underestimates in the sense that um, uh, getting representative figures uh, during household surveys are not easy because many times females, uh, when they are asked these questions, whether they've ever experienced any of these, um, they cannot necessarily answer very truthfully because um, it's normally uh, life partners and domestic partners that have um, wrought these um, this uh, physical violence. So I think uh, it's important to realize that these figures are probably considerably higher um, across the spectrum. But um, I think it, it still tells a very sad story indeed. And I think that was the very last slide. Thank you very much, ma'am. Alex? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope all of us, we are now aware of the state of our provinces in terms of hunger and as well in terms of unemployment, how, it, how the percentage in terms of grants, it's something that we need to think about when we do our planning in our provinces. Then without then wasting time, let's go to the next uh, presentation, which will be done by Ms. Dabula, from finance, Commissioner from Financial and and Fiscal uh, Commission. Ms. Dabula, over to you. Uh, uh, Ms. Nita, Honorable Nita, can you please call on the Commissioner to say something before Ms. Madabula do the presentation? Commissioner Rockman. Okay, it's fine. I will allow him to. And remind the, remind the members to open their videos as far as possible for the broadcast. Ne? Okay, Please, can we plead with all of us to open our videos so that our faces are seen? Thank you. Uh, Over morning. to you, Commissioner. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members and our colleagues in the platform. I'm, I'm Elsby Rockman. I'm a Commissioner with the Financial and Fiscal Commission. Um, part of our delegation in the meeting today is also Dr. Kay Brown, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the FFC. Now, I'll just make a few opening remarks and then hand over to Ms. Nomondi Madubula, who's one of our senior um, colleagues in FFC, who will take us through the presentation. Now, we know the FFC is an, an independent, permanent statutory institution established in terms of Section 220 of the Constitution. And we function in terms of the FFC Act. Our main focus is primarily on the equitable division of nationally collected revenue among the three spheres of government and any other financial and fiscal matters. Now, we know that Black African female headed households are the, the poorest of the poor. And unemployment plays a much bigger role and has much bigger impact on women in general than in men. Now, we expect our intergovernmental fiscal relations system to be responsive to the needs of women and the imperative for, to move women out of poverty and unemployment, because this will be to the greater advancement of society in general. Now, the, our presentation today focuses on the research work that has been conducted by the FFC 
on the gender responsiveness of municipal budgeting processes particularly. So let me hand over to Ms. Namonde Maribula to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Commissioner. Can I give it to Ms. Namonde? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, good morning, uh, honorable members. Can I please ask uh, Kevin to flight the slides for me? Thank you. The next one. I'll pass this one. Commissioner Rockman has highlighted it. Thank you. Next one. Thank you. I will just highlight on this one as uh, the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Nelru, have also touched on it that um, it is indeed uh, that despite a uh, government commitment to gender equality through various policy and legislative measures, including the anti-discrimination legislation and other policies, unacceptable gender inequalities persist as we have had our presenter from States SA saying that uh, female uh, headed Black African female-headed households are the one who carries the brand. I will move on to the next slide as he has touched on this one. Uh, another one. Thank you, yes, this is the slide I want. Uh, FFC in light of this background uh, is of the view that one avenue that should receive greater emphasis in the intergovernmental fiscal relationship uh, relation system in South Africa is a, a need for a successful HFR system, which should be sensitive to the needs of women and be able to contribute to moving them out of poverty. In order for that to happen, FFC is of the view that innovations in policy design and implementations are required to ensure gender sensitive uh, resources allocation takes place. The FFC in light of this background uh, did a study where it assessed the gender responsiveness, of, uh, gender responsiveness of municipal budgeting processes. Uh, the study followed two approach. It uh, randomly selected uh, 30 municipalities uh, where it uh, reviewed their IDP uh, plans, which is the integrated development plans to see uh, what, are the, what is happening in terms of uh, gender issues and gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting. Also, in light of that case studies are also uh, covering seven municipalities across the four, four provinces were conducted in the Gauteng, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Free State. Uh, I'll look, I would like to also uh, mention that in the municipalities that were randomly selected, the Northwest, Eastern Cape, and Gauteng were part of those where in the Gauteng, it was the Western District Municipality and some of its uh, local municipalities. In the, in the Northwest, it was Ngaka Modiri, Mulema District Municipalities, as well as some of the local municipalities. In the Eastern Cape, it was Amatole District Municipalities and some of the local municipalities uh, that were uh, taking place in this study. Uh, the particular focus, on the four sectors in terms of the, the case study approach, as well as the, uh, the municipalities, it looked at four sectors, which is the local economic development, the water and sanitation, the early childhood development, as well as uh, housing infrastructure. The reason that FFC selected uh, these indicators because we know that these indicators, according to research, they do alleviate plight of women in terms of moving them out of poverty. So that was the reason that FFC selected uh, these four indicators. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the findings from the IDP scans, uh, the results indicated that there is lack of gender mainstreaming and women empowerment as an approach at the municipal level, both the district and the local. There's also lack of gender disaggregated data. That means between the males and females. If there is a uh, data, you find that it's just used for population purposes only, instead of also be uh, used as a channel so that we know what is happening in terms of uh, gender issues. Uh, also, some of the findings were that uh, it's more about equis, equity versus the mainstreaming of gender equality, where it's more about uh, numbers, how many women uh, were, were, were hired at a particular level, 
uh, there's less approach in terms of more equal opportunities for, for both uh, genders. There's also weak translation of gender equality commitments into fiscal commitments. What do we mean by this is that IDPs uh, show little evidence of the manner in which the IDP planning processes and budget uh, offices have budgeted for, 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 for gender mainstreaming or gender lens. Next slide. Uh, from the uh, provincial level, as I've mentioned earlier, also some of the case studies were taken into account. The findings from the case study approach as well followed the similar approach with the municipalities, uh, that there is poor translation of the national agenda on women empowerment and gender equality into local government uh, programs, as well as here we find that uh, there's limited uh, data which is disaggregated as well as uh, if uh, gender events uh, took place, they are all, always uh, calendar events. If it's Women's Day, then you will see that there's something that uh, provinces are doing or local municipalities are doing. And after that, there's no sustainability. Then it will be touched on again next year. There is lack of gender budget training and capacity building for of decision makers, including the poor institu institutionalization of gender responsive budgeting. There's also absence of analysis of, of existing revenues and expenditure. Next okay. slide. Come on. Yeah, I'm calling, I'm calling, I'm calling, baby. No, before that one, before that one. Oh, sorry. Hey, what is your issue? But you are the present. I can't even see if you are me. Can you please mute? Thank you. Uh, some of the reasons for, for limited uh, gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting at the local level were highlighted as absence of an approved gender policy across municipalities. There's also absence of strategy at the municipal level. We also find that also those in personnel management, that is those who are supposed to make decisions, as well as the budget officers who are supposed to uh, track the expenditure, have limited knowledge in terms of how to go about doing this. There's also, in terms of gender equality indicators and collection of uh, gender disaggregation, the information is limited. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, in light of these findings, the FFC made some recommendations which were accepted by uh, government, where at the national and provincial government, the FFC recommended that the national and provincial government should run gender budgeting pilots in a few municipalities first and evaluate the results before wider application can took place. The FFC was of the view that these pilots could be linked to ensuring gender disaggregated data for key conditional grants as per the grant framework in the Division of Revenue Act, like if the focus perhaps can be on water and sanitation grants, as we know that they alleviate a plight of women, the ECD grants, perhaps as a first step, this can be done. Also, the FFC recommended that at the national and provincial government should ensure municipal integrated uh, development plans are in institutionalized uh, by the planning sector, such as the water and sanitation sector, as well as in the local economic development program programs. And also this data should be disaggregated according to performance indicators and targets, including providing gender budgeting, good practice guides and tools and toolkits. Also, the FFC uh, recommended that the national and provincial government will provide guidelines for collecting this data for budgeting process and ensure that municipalities have the capacity to analyze budget uh, from a gender lens. Uh, the response by government was that government supports the proposal which will ensure that the collection and allocation of public resources uh, is effectively carried out and contribute towards ad, uh, advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. It will provide tools as well to assess the different needs and contributions of women, uh, men, boys and girls within the existing revenue expenditure and, and allocations. And it will call for adjusted uh, budget uh, policies to benefit for all groups. The next slide. At the local level, the FFC recommended that the local government should 
institutionalized gender responsive uh, budgeting process linked to their IDPs and build capacity for, for gender mainstreaming and gender responsive budgeting at local level and show that gender responsive uh, appropriation and budget allocation takes place and ensure that there is gender sensitive public participation and consultation at the local level as the, the, the speaker who opened have also indicated that uh, the effective pu uh, public participation uh, in terms of decision making do go a long way in terms of addressing some of the issues uh, that are contributing towards uh, gender empowerment, especially for women. In terms of government response, uh, government indicated that gender responsive budget analysis along with uh, legislation and other policy measures can indeed address the gender bias and discrimination that uh, is currently uh, we have. It is indeed a step towards increased accountability and public transparency as it can shift economic policies leading to gains across society for all. However, the proposal implementation may be hindered by capacity constraints at the municipal level. Uh, next slide, I think I'm done. Thank you. That was the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, these recommendations, I think they are so useful. I hope provinces that are present today will utilize them and customize them to fit the situation of their own provinces. And they, they, they become, one, a tool for them to do oversight and on the other side, they also get implemented. So that's my view in terms of the recommendations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Matwood. Can we then go to the next speaker, which is Honorable Ms. R. Kekana, Ilungel Belekeklele Parliament. Over to you, Slav. Ms. Kekana? Is Honorable Kekana part of us? Yes, ma'am, I'm part of you. Can can you All just right. keep me? I've got a, a bit of a, a challenge here, and I'll speak afterwards, after the next speak. Okay. Uh, Honorable Deputy Chair, that means I give over to you if that's a situation, yes, but can, can we, uh, over so to you, Deputy Chairperson, can we just get an indication as to when Ms. Kekana will be ready? Because we, we are having three other speakers now, and the, my, my yes. concern is that will we finish the other speakers or when will we expect her to, to can you just give an indication? Ms. Kekana, is yes, it possible for you to indicate your time uh, you are asking to get ready? Yes, you can just give me five minutes. Okay, it's five minutes. Let's, let's rather have a, a small break and then you continue. Can we have the small yeah. break of five minutes, go and uh, grab a break. cup of tea, drink water, and then after five minutes, we come back to Ms. Kegana. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Honorable Kekana, are you ready? Are you I'm ready? Still, no, ma'am, I'm still struggling with my uh, uh, my gadget here. That's why I can't even show my face, yes. I'll be ready in your short time. You are audible. You are very Hello. audible. Yes. Honorable Nita, I was just asking Honorable Kekana whether she's ready. She's struggling yes. with the video. She's struggling with the video, but she's got audio. So possibly we can continue while they while they work on that. Okay. So we cut short our break. We'll come in in seven minutes' time. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm ready. I'm giving over to you, Honorable Deputy Chair. You are still chairing on the session where Honorable uh, <laughs> Kekana will be making input there. So I think it is still okay. your. What is this sound? Honorable Chair, can I request that uh, the next speaker speak and then I'll, I'll, I hope that after that I'll be ready. We gave the break to allow you to get ready because we don't want to break up the program. Each yeah. of the, the first, the first, uh, the first uh, part of the program was for the presentations, and the the second part is for for provinces to tell us and with regards to their own programs. So it is a different. The, the purpose is differently, and that is the reason why we are asking you to continue because you are audible, and possibly whilst you are busy, they can try to restore your video. So that is the reason why, and I I I am actually. I'm not willing to change the program because I want the flow of the program to continue the way it is. Because I'm sure uh, we can hear you very, we can hear you. And if people can still continue trying to open another gadget for you to, so that you can be visible, it will assist. Otherwise we will continue and then we will possibly give you only at the end of the, of the session. Honorable Nita, advice. Advise me. Zuki. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take her and, and yeah, yeah, yes, Chair, Deputy Chair. I'm saying let, 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 let us continue with the presentations from the provinces as planned, yeah. and then we'll yeah. allow her right at the end. We'll continue with the flow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the advice, and I think then we will continue. And uh, Honorable Moila, you, uh, Moila, you are already on the platform. And the second session, we we are doing it how we have usually done the high level sessions, where we give provinces the opportunity to tell us about their uh, progress with with gender uh, the gender mainstreaming program of action within the province. And we will give over to the MEC for Social Development in the Northwest Province, Honorable Tumi Moelwa. You will be the one that will be presenting now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, Honorable Members. Um, if my presentation can be highlighted on the screen, I'm not sure who's who's doing that share. Kevin, do you have a presentation? Share the screen. No, I don't, ma'am. Okay. Um, okay, no, it's fine. Uh, Honorable uh, Moelwa, I think you can continue whilst the officers sort the issue of presentation out. Ne? Of presentation out. Okay. I will, we will thank ask you. Him. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Chair, let me take this opportunity to thank you to invite us to come and do a presentation on what we are doing as a province and 
the achievements that we have uh, we have in the province in terms of a uh, gender based violence a chair chair and it was highlighted that as having plans that province and the other uh, training that is needed for gender mainstreaming at senior levels because you get people that yes we talk gender based violence but at the end of the day some of them don't even understand how to implement the very programs that we spoke about as as a province we we sit down we develop programs but then we then have challenges in terms of that the other challenge that we are having chair i'm starting with the, with the challenges that we need to sort out is that in terms of the ballot budget allocation for women empowerment programs that's 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 another thing that we are raising as a province to say that we need to have a deliberate program on where we are saying that this is allocated for women and today these things are happening ad hocly we're not having a deliberate to say that as a, as 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 us as government as a province this is what we are doing uh, in terms of the, the budget you get the budget cuts and it really affects our programs these are some of the things that i wanted to to talk about in terms of the challenges but our focal point um, chair is that we need to uh, strengthen and resource in terms of participation in the in our province in terms of uh, gender based violence office on the status of women needs to properly resource us to enable it in full uh, participation and at administrative level in the province especially the oversight mandate uh, you know you know chair the I'm, I'm skipping other slides i want to go to uh, the the system weaknesses that impede gender responsive budgeting across the three spheres of government we as as a province yes we are trying to push the budget to say that let's put this budget for our youth in disability and our older people uh, or persons with disabilities and women but at the end of the day you find that the the budget on mainstreaming is not processed like it has to be and gender and other equally concerned to be mainstreamed into every aspect of government operations you know gender as an as a challenge for us gender as an equality and transformation issue they need to be one of the budgetary priorities you know you need to budget and say that like i said the specific gender targets to be reflected in the mtf priorities because we talk gender based violence or priorities we talk to them when we are done with mtf priorities so it means that when we deal with this thing we must be specific and say that in the mtf priority we also need to put uh, the gender targets there to say that this is what we are going to do all budget and expenditure reports to be accompanied by a gender impact statement because you get Uh, the reports but they don't talk about gender impact uh, in their budget so and procurement processes and outcomes related to distribution of state contracts within government be be reviewed and special measures be implemented to remove barriers preventing equal access to contract opportunities for women these are some of the things that we are talking about in the province and chair if i may go to systemic weakness that that i i spoke about i'm talking about on the planning side now 
the outputs, indicators, and targets to be put in place to strengthen the institutional capacity to mainstream women, youth, and disability rights. Because once you don't put them in a planning stage, um, then we, we just fill the cracks as time goes on. Because you, you get to these things like now, we are getting into 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It's when you will hear all the provincial departments talking about gender-based violence, but not saying that at the initial planning stage, where are we putting that so that we are able to say, we are covering youth, we are covering women, we are covering disability, uh, people living with disability. And compliance to the National Policy Framework for Women Empowerment and Gender Equality and international obligations relating to gender HA. Planning data across government departments will be disaggregated by gender. And all our plans and policies and activities will be tested for gender impact before approval. This is, as, as a department, we are saying we are going to do because you look at these things and you see that at the end of the day, there's no impact. Women priorities in our province will be clearly spelled out and integrated into organizational priorities reflected in strategic plans, annual performance plans and IDP with implementation and monitoring that will be enforced. Because once you don't do that, then it's, it's, it's a challenge. Now, what we have done as, as uh, the, the province on support in terms of the topic that we are talking about today is that victim support service bill currently in government gazette protection of victims within the criminal justice system. Uh, DSD has contributed on amendments of the Domestic Violence Act. These are some of, but some of the things that we, we have done. So in the, in the province, we have established the coordinating structure of GBVF in the province, which actually is assisting a lot and it's, it's, it's been championed by the premier and at the provincial level and by mayors at local level with the objective of localizing and ensuring its interface to the district development model. As we know that from uh, when the president announced the district development model, then we have to align ourselves on dealing with each and every uh, thing that we do. It has to be um, aligned to district development model. It will grow from the current DSD provincial GBVF form. It's not only going to be with us as DSD, but all the departments because the premier is leading that. A response plan has been drafted for the province by the department and the outcomes include improved access for GBV survivors to essential care, justice support and protection support prevention services and intervention, public education campaigns around survivors' rights, patriarchy and related forms of discrimination and inequalities. The other thing is that increased access for women to economic opportunities, which is something that I have highlighted here that we, we often talk about this thing, but we don't have a plan clear to say that this is a deliberate plan that we are going to implement at an initial stage in planning in everything that we do. But DSD has, DSD has implemented leadership program in partnership with SANA and PCA. So we are chair. When we talk now of economic development, environment and conservation and tourism, we are actually uh, going to collaborate with, with um, Proudly South Africa to promote by local campaign. It will target women, youth, persons with disabilities, 7,360 women own businesses 
and spatial reference at district level will be supported. In collaboration with the Department of Industry and Co Competition to develop local manufacturing capabilities so that a target of 5,900 products can be sourced from local women suppliers per district. Uh, in Bojanala, we are targeting 2,512, Dr. KK, 1,320, RSM, Dr. RSM, 752, and Nakamudir Mulema, 1,320, uh, Chair. Chair, these are the things that we are talking about as, as SDSD, and we are saying that young women entrepreneurs we are also targeting 2,920 to establish so that they can establish their own businesses that will be spatially referenced as follows. You know, we divide in them in terms of the, the districts. And, and Che, now when we, we're still talking about the economic development, we are to support 14,045 female enterprises that are operating in the townships and rural areas with financial and non-financial support per district. This is what we are doing. To, and we are to offer dedicated skill support to small enterprises through a network of 19 incubation centers and digital hubs, including partner network of incubators and hubs accredited by CEDA. Bujanala um, supporting 5,024 female as a startup. Dr. KK supporting 2,624 as a startup. Uh, and we also to support 292 majority owned women cooperatives across four districts that have the potential to generate income and profit or are already generating income and profit because we can't say that those who are already generating income and profit, we are closing them out. We are also putting them in, in the same uh, team so that they can also be empowered over what they are doing now. We, to develop the Northwest SMMEs COVID relief fund administered by Northwest, develop, uh, Northwest Development of Environment and Conservation to cushion the small businesses during lockdown, 40% uh, of the budget of 16 million is targeted to support women-owned SMMEs and informal traders. To reinstate targeting 40% beneficiaries to be women-owned enterprises, Chair. When we go to social development, currently, Chair, DSD funded five NPOs for implementation of social and behavioral change programs. One per district cost 30 million to include men championing change program. YOLO for youth, family matters, and the ROG, leadership and dreams. These are some of the things that we have done. We are actually funding, funding of men's sector, Banabua. We are saying as a department that about gender-based violence and we are in these structures that we are working with men for real and establishing range of men's lounge. We have established them, we have established a men's lounge in Dawu and we could so in JB Max. We are only left with uh, the one in Bujanala because when we were launching the one in Mamusa, in Dr. Ruth Sukumusi Mumpat, men were asking us about whether in their districts are we going to launch them. So we did that and um, that's, that's really assisting. 791 persons participated in community engagement program on rebuilding and social cohesion. Uh, I did conduct chair oversight visit at Rato White Door because we also have 
a white door in Rato with, with a community. The 839 people reached through various community engagements in partnership with civil society organization, victims and 16 household safety gadgets to vulnerable groups and 600 personal alarms were distributed shared as, as the province in terms of the Department of Social Development. This is what we have done. And the current, currently, what we are doing, we have partnered with Northwest Childline, FAMSA, and Lifeline to provide online counseling and referrals to assistance and support because we are in a rural province chair. At, at, at times, our victims are not able to access our facilities because they have to travel long distances. So this is some of the things that we are saying that in order for us to achieve what we are providing to our people, the services that we are providing, we are in partnership with a uh, this um, a child line, FAMSA and lifeline. Uh, another thing is that 10 additional social workers have been appointed at shelters. A chair in our shelters, we have Tutuzela Center to improve. And then social service providers capacitated and trauma debriefing and management. These are some of the things that we are doing. We have partnered and funded 22 appointed social service professionals, social workers, social auxiliary workers, those that are going to assist us in moving forward share. These are some of the things that we are doing. And in COCTA, they are also assisting women programs because what they did is that when they were appointing they prioritized women contractors to say, let us see how we then empower women because most of the women become vulnerable because they don't have anything to put on the table. So these are the things that we are doing, Chair. I think uh, we will then provide you with the presentation, Chair, the whole presentation. I, I wanted to talk to the slides and sum up, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Mwailwa for the, for the presentation. We appreciate, we will not discuss the presentation immediately. We will allow for the other presentations to be done and then we will discuss them collectively. That I'm saying to those that want to have clarities and also want to ask questions and make some inputs, prepare your inputs and your questions. We will then at the end of the three presentations as well as the presentation of Rafael Kekana, we will then allow for engagement with the presentations. So we are continuing and we will now ask the Honorable Mazibuko, Faith Mazibuko of Haute to do the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, and thank you, Deputy Chair, and thank you very much for allowing Gauteng to make presentation. I don't know if uh, our presentation was received and that it will be loaded. It was sent through to our office there in Cape Town, but whilst we await for them, Chair, I'll just continue. Our presentation uh, will focus mainly on what we're giving uh, starting with the purpose, introduction, background, discussion, gender, main, gender mainstreaming program of action, provincial gender machinery, gender responsive budgeting process, and national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide. Uh, on the uh, purpose of our presentation, uh, Honorable Chair, and greetings to all uh, other members that have joined us uh, this afternoon. My apology for not uh, greeting. Uh, our presentation is focusing mainly on what we're given and our strategic interventions that needs to be taken in order to advance the functionality of the provincial gender machinery and gender responsive budgeting processes so as to ensure a sufficient resource allocation towards the implementation of a multi-sectoral gender equality uh, program. 
Uh, on introduction, I won't get much. I'm sure a uh, honorable deputy chair has already touched on quite a lot of things that have been done since for the past 25 years. I'll, even on the background, I won't dwell much. Uh, I'll, I'll go to uh, on our discussion. The development and empowerment of women remain a priority area for the Houghton City region. Since its inception 25 years ago, the democratic government has introduced a number of policies and programs which have contributed to the development of women and, empower, and empowerment of them to play a more meaningful role in, in society. The Houghton Provincial Government broadened its vision to move the province beyond economic outcomes when it, come, when it launched the GGT 20, 2030, which is Growing Houghton Together, our roadmap towards 2030. And through the GGT 2030, we reflect how the Houghton City region seeks to address the fundamental problems facing the residents of Houghton. On gender mainstreaming, uh, honorable members. Uh, I will start from the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. Uh, the department ensures that uh, women are trained in script writing and directing uh, workshops. So they call it Basitana script writing. And they have come to base arts and culture all day programs where a majority of programs also do take place. Imagine community DJs where they support uh, up and coming women DJs through training and equipment. There are also job opportunities that have been created through arts and culture programs. Uh, and also uh, the arts and culture organizations also have been supported, especially those that have women among them. Practitioners also have benefited from capacity building. Imagine fashion designers also uh, have been assisted. Heroes, heroes and heroines have also uh, been honored through the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture and through the various programs that they have, including Heritage. And from, the, from, uh, from health, we have programs of maternal and neonatal infant and child mortality uh, that has been reduced. Majority of people who actually die in these institutions are women through what you know as a, 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 a challenges that they, they face when they go and give birth. People, will, people living with HIV and AIDS are also tested, initiate, initiated on treatment and retained on care. A maternal and neonatal infant and child mortality rate at the department seeks to reduce it and it encourages women to come to the clinics very early so that then they are assisted. Teenage pregnancy is also another challenge and the department is focusing on, and they are, they've put together programs <clears throat> so as to be able to manage them. Antenatal care visits before 20 weeks have been increased morbidity and morbidity, morbid I'm not MC for health, and premature mortality due to communicable disease also has been uh, reduced through the mother to child transmission, also of HIV and AIDS uh, eliminated. The morbidity and premature mortality due to non communicable non communicable diseases also has been reduced by 10%. And also the department seeks to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 related uh, uh, mortality to uh, uh, both, women, both women and vulnerable pe uh, people. Aspects of healthy lifestyles also is conducted in communities where people are rich through uh, programs on healthy lifestyles that encourages them to always uh, exercise. Even older uh, women and uh, older men where they, are, uh, where they are able to be made to exercise and that be able to fight lifestyle diseases. The Houghton Department of Health through its Batupiri pr uh, principle uh, and transgender is also committed in upholding, promoting and protecting the rights of patients. And this commitment is guided by several policy and legislative uh, documents. The province will continuously ensure that the Batupiri principles is adhered to by constantly raising awareness on the principles for health practitioners. Transgender inclusive healthcare ensures access for, for the marginalized. For example, at, in Hillbro, we do have at the SLN clinic, it does provide healthcare services for transgender uh, people. Plans are underway for a permanent transgender inclusive healthcare uh, services in the province. From the Department of ECAF, ICT industry stimulation and entrepreneurship. Uh, Township-based ICT uh, entrepreneurs are also supported, especially those that are of women. And women are also benefiting from the ICT skills development program that, they, that, that we call Action Lab program. 
There are also ICT bursaries that are also uh, uh, offered and targeted specifically uh, for women. Under the Department of Cooperative Government, Government and Governance and Traditional Affairs, work opportunities have been created through the EPWP and Community Works uh, uh, program. Councillors and officials have also been trained on GOD mainstreaming. Municipalities also, uh, through their credible ITPs, they've been made to, to be aligned to the SDGs, to the IUDF, to the SPLUMA, and to the DTMs, which is your district development model. The municipalities also are supported to develop indigent policies that are aligned to our Houting Indigent Policy uh, Framework. And uh, we were asked to respond to a question uh, in relation to the broad overview of interventions to support districts in the province. And uh, the response will be the department as part of its monitoring and supporting districts to mainstream gender. The following pl plans are in place for the 2020-2021 uh, uh, financial year. First one is capacity building and training of councillors and officials on gender mainstreaming, cascading the gender responsive planning, budgeting, monitoring, evaluation and auditing framework in a form of training continuous workshop and awareness sessions to municipalities to ensure that they integrate gender fully in the integrated development plans and service delivery budget integrated uh, plans. Uh, also, we were asked to respond to a question to outline interventions uh, consistently to support gender shift in the provision of services by municipalities. Our response is that the assessment in a form of a study of the status of gender mainstreaming in municipalities the report will assist COCTA to put in place support mechanism to ensure that gender mainstreaming municipalities, where there are gaps in terms of gender policies and other support, including oversight structures, such as the women's multi party caucuses, section 79 committees, GOD committees, and et cetera, in municipalities. Then SALCA and the Commission on Gender Equality and COCTA to then bring direct support to ensure that gaps are actually uh, filled. Provincial Treasury. Uh, they approve strategic framework in, in implementing reports such as your gender mainstreaming and job access. They monitor the including of inclusion of gender responsive planning, budgeting, monitoring, evaluation, and auditing in the departmental strategic plans and annual performance, allocation of budgets to achieve gender priorities and expenditure review under gender outcomes. And they also make sure that gender responsiveness to the to be they are addressed across the budget cycle, budget cycle and MTF uh, cycle. From the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, the department does support women women producers, and the department does support community food gardens, where majority are women who are actually uh, starting uh, these gardens. There are agri parks where majority of women also are targeted to be part and parcel of these agri parks, uh, such as one in uh, Akenhof, where the department put infrastructure and then all uh, uh, women who are interested in farming actually are participating. They also put in uh, the uh, tunnels and make sure that there's access of water. And through uh, uh, EPWP, there are also web opportunities that have been created and in ensuring that uh, Women also do participate through uh, various uh, programs of environment and Libu Kibutu and other all other programs. From the Department of Roads and Transport, through the uh, EPWP also, construction jobs have been uh, created through the implementation of the EPWP uh, principles and the re road rehabilitation uh, program. Uh, quite a lot of women also have participated in these uh, programs and uh, the road maintenance uh, job opportunities also have been created through the EPWP. Although we just believe that it's not enough to put women through the EPWP pro programs because it's just a, a, statement, a stipend that they actually get of 2.5. But we believe the department can do more in ensuring that more and more women do participate in the road construction environment. From the Department of Human Settlements, job creation and skills development through cooperatives that have been established and they are supported by the department. Emerging contractors participate in the incubator program where majority of them are actually uh, assisted in starting uh, their construction companies and even being incubated in ensuring that they reach a uh, level uh, two or level three 
of the CITB. Job creation and skills development through this program, work opportunities were created and through the Human Settlements Development Grant and the EPWP Incentive Grant in each financial year. Provision of housing opportunities, stands and housing units across the, uh, uh, the province to complement the shortage of, has, of, of housing. You'll recall that as Gauteng, we are also, a, all, all other people from all provinces, they come to Gauteng and uh, looking for work opportunities. Of course, this then creates a challenge that people can't necessarily, all of them get houses. They end up living in, in, in informal settlement. So the department is releasing a land for women and families to be able to build and have stable uh, homes. Through our FLISP uh, program also, housing subsidies are dispersed to qualifying beneficiaries uh, uh, every year. Listing of beneficiaries from the beneficiary management linked to planned units and service stand. And some of these approved beneficiaries are already being allocated housing units, as I indicated, even the land that uh, as part of the rapid land release program that uh, the department is embarking on. Provision of housing opportunities, uh, new title deeds, sorry, new title deeds uh, have also been registered and pri provided to homeowners within six months of occupation. And new properties have also been transferred to qualifying beneficiaries uh, within six months of, of occupation every financial year. Title deeds are also issued to rightful beneficiaries pre-1994 and to date. On the, from the Department of Infrastructure Development, of course, it is a department that deals majority with your PWP work opportunities in the construction because it's all departments that are constructing. So it's them that ensure that uh, uh, those work opportunities do exist. And also they do report uh, under social sector and they also report under uh, economic uh, sector. They also do report under environmental sector uh, to the national uh, 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 public works. Emerging women, black firms also have been empowered through the contractors development program that uh, this happens every year. EPWP beneficiaries successfully also complete skills development uh, program. From the Department of Social Development, gender, youth and mainstreaming uh, through what we call GOD mainstreaming capacity building sessions are actually conducted. Shelters for vulnerable women have been constructed in Gauteng. HIV and AIDS uh, beneficiaries, they receive psychosocial support services. There is also restor restorative services where people are reached through, so people are reached, especially those that have been victims of social crime. And they're also taught how to prevent and be able to participate in these programs. Substance abuse also, prevention and rehabilitation, where parents and caregivers participate in the Kimoja program. Poverty alleviation and sustainable livelihood people benefiting from poverty reduction initiatives, including our welfare to work a program where we target majority of women who are beneficiaries of grants, train them and skill them and make them to leave the, uh, the grant system, but be able to, to work for, the, for, for themselves. Dignity packs are also distributed to young women, especially, especially those that are at a high school and also people participating in income generating programs and economic uh, opportunities. Uh, still in the Department of Social Development, institutional capacity building and support for NPOs is done by the department, especially cooperatives that are linked to economic uh, opportunities. Majority of women that are in these cooperatives are the ones that are making school uniform and that is distributed to our schools and others are also doing a uh, food gardening. On victim empowerment program, victims of crime and violence do access psychosocial uh, support services. Human trafficking victims also are assisted by the department in assess, ac accessing these social uh, uh, services. Perpetrators participate also in programs for intimate partner violence, which is PIPV, for them to be able to start uh, uh, thinking otherwise instead of them always uh, abusing women. Men are also reached through the empowerment uh, programs, especially through the programs called Kuluma Dota. There was a question that we were asked to respond to, especially uh, pertaining to social development, whereby they said we must outline the interventions by the department to avail more safe houses for, for women, particularly in the GPV hotspots. And our, the response that we are tabling, uh, Deputy uh, Chair, is that the three regions in which the hotspots were identified currently 
do have shelters for women, for victims of gender-based violence. And Johannesburg currently has five shelters, and not one of these uh, shelters are full to capacity. But prior to COVID, to, uh, during COVID, also levels five to two, and during level one and lockdown uh, 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 times. So it means they are not full because people remember they were at home, they could not go out. But uh, after we intervened, we've seen an improvement. Sidibang region has one shelter and Tswane region has also six shelters that can host uh, GPV victims. The department has requested the Department of, also of Public Works to donate more of their buildings that uh, they will be uh, 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 that are available, so as to be able to utilize them to shelter, to shelter services. Then this will also be inclusive uh, services to LGBTI plus plus and men can also be assisted to be able to move into these uh, places. We're also uh, requested to respond to a question about programs in place to implement prevention strategies to keep GPVF and measures in place to access to assess the impact of prevention strategies, particularly in hotspots, and our response as in the Department of uh, uh, Social Development, the hotspots areas that were identified by SAPS as, and working together with the forensic social workers uh, so that then they offer, offer psychosocial support to victims of GPV in those hotspots. The department is also focusing on behavior change, which can only be assessed on a long term and as an intervention to behavior change can lead to a decrease in, GPV, in GPVF, which is more a longitudinal assessment than impact assessment over a period of few months. For example, the impact of prevention programs currently offered by school social workers and GPV social workers and the victim empowerment uh, 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 units uh, where NPOs are deployed, uh, their, their young boys do participate and will only be able to measure when they are involved in these relationships and not display any violence against their partners. So sometimes it takes longer to be able to see the outcome of such programs. The prevention programs implemented are also conducted via the radio, social media, door-to-door -door outreaches by departmental social workers and uh, those that are in the NPO sector that are working very closely uh, with the Department of Social Development. The department, Another question we're asked to respond to interventions in place to provide adequate care, support, and healing for victims of violence. Our response is that the capacity building to professional staff on issues of trauma debriefing, trafficking in persons, the LGBTIQ communities, to ensure that they are empowered and skilled to offer adequate and effective services to victims of violence. The social workers are also linked with psychologists at the Department of Health and all referrals to psych psychologists in private practice to offer counseling where is needed. Victims are also referred to treatment centers for detoxification, where they've been using substances as a means to cope with their abuse. And we're also uh, asked to further continue responding and we, we indicate that training is also provided to the support staff on issues of emotional intelligence, self-development, and during forum meetings, a number of issues are being addressed, like effective communication, conflict resolution. The department also has planned training for the cookers and house mothers in the shelters. That will also focus on good housekeeping, preparation of food, etc. During the 2020 shelter in Daba, information was also shared with board members on good governance and the roles and responsibilities from the Department of Community Safety. This is the department that is the provincial champion in the fight against uh, gender-based violence and, and femicide and coordinates uh, all the programs and services that are meant to support victims and survivors. I hope my network is still okay. Uh, SAPS members that have been deployed at various v yes. VECs. Yes. Hello? Am I audible? Still okay, sister. SAPS members that are deployed at VECs are also trained on implementation of gender-based violence, and they are the ones that are able to report and ensure that they keep data. The fight against crime also, CPF members are also trained in helping women on monitoring and evaluation. Domestic, the Domestic Violence Act 
compliance report are compiled every year. And we're also monitoring that all police stations do have rape kits. The provincial GPV response plan, uh, the GPV VF uh, victims are also receiving support. And reports on GPV case tracking within the criminal justice system is also done. And when there are GPV closed dockets, those dockets are also uh, analyzed and to determine why they were closed without proper prosecution. Still on community safety, we were asked to outline interventions in place to address the endemic nature of gender-based violence and femicide in the province with particular focus on GPV hotspots and areas of concern. Our response is that the department has done an analysis of stations reflecting on the GPV hotspots. Stations listed under the National Top 30 and overall holistic uh, GPV trends in Gauteng. Thus, following SAPS support programs will be effected during 16 days of activity. <coughs> My apologies. What we'll be doing, a uh, uh, Deputy Chair, is that there'll be a special allocation of vehicles that will assist with the transportation of GPV uh, victims or services uh, to, to those stations that need to assist uh, the victims, especially these ones that are within the top 30 hotspots. Uh, stations also have been identified. There is current consideration of a holistic view with the Department of Justice, especially on the statistics that are coming from there for them to be able to assist in fast tracking some of these uh, cases medical legal interventions and reports at stations. All the nine stations reflected in the top 30 national list, as well as some of the stations that form part of the CHIPS, which is your Houting Improvement Policing Performance System. This need, is, this need is prioritized as a measure to limit secondary victimization. All provincial departments and stakeholders are informed of GPV hotspots to ensure that the quantum of GPV services are arranged in those uh, 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 areas. Still on community safety, uh, we have Ikala Temba, and through its interventions, we have introduced green doors, which uh, have been deployed in various uh, wards within our province. Green doors are places of safety in a ward that aims to receive and assist clients that are residing in that area that are disadvantaged in terms of the victim empowerment centers. You'll recall that sometimes the police station is very far. And as a result, the victims are not able to access uh, those services at the police station. They then come to these green doors, and these green doors, they make sure that they link them to the near. It's a tertiary institution. Some of them will be uh, 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 officially launching them during the 16 days of activism to ensure that uh, young women at, who are also victims of GPV, of GPV and women trafficking are also able to get uh, assistance uh, in those uh, institutions. We are also uh, uh, implementing floor management model, which is aimed to minimize the secondary victimization at police stations and ensuring that victims are directed to a private space where they can be emotionally contained and offered quality victim empowerment centers. To date, the department has provided laptops to ensure that there's recording, tracing, and follow-up on case management. And the community uh, safety also uh, support VECs with volunteers that specifically work 24-7 on rotation basis. This is to ensure that services are available at all times, at all hours at the police station. Plans are in place also to assist with stipend to pay those unfunded VECs uh, 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 in order for them to focus more on ensuring that they're always available. The reinforcing of cases also as part of uh, integrated intervention on the GPV. Other interventions that are done uh, by the department through Ikale Chamber, they ensure that client's readiness as a credible witness also in order to secure a, a conviction when they go to court. Planned case management system, case tracking and analysis of GPV trends in hotspot areas with a view of gathering data and defining intervention. Through the Family Justice Service, a rapid response team focuses on case tracking, psychosocial support, court education and preparedness, and court pre and post debriefing, capacity building for, for frontliners, intervention focused on limiting compassion, fatigue, and ensure high level uh, uh, of service. 
The Department of Community Safety was asked to respond to a question on progress made in implementing interventions to ensure that there's adequate provision of rape kits at police stations and expediating the DNA test. The response is that the Office of the Provincial Commissioner ensures that all police stations have sufficient number of rape kits and they make sure that the stock levels are reported weekly by all police stations. They ensure that station commanders submit certificates to verify that the station has sufficient rape kits. The forensic science laboratory management are also engaged on an ongoing basis to expedite DNA testing there is, however, still a backlog of cases at these uh, forensic uh, science uh, laboratories due, a shortage of, due to the shortage of consumables utilizing for the uh, testing of uh, exhibits. Uh, there was a question that we were asked to respond also to, inter to, to, to outline interventions to ensure the necessary sensitivity in the treatment of victims of GPV, particularly by police at police stations, uh, GPV crimes and safe houses. The response is that the SAPS has implemented the South African Police Service Action Plan for gender-based violence and sexual offenses on the 1st of August in 2020. The objectives of this action are to reduce the number of reported crimes against women, reduce the number of domestic violence offenses, increase detection rate of perpetrators of domestic violence, increase detection rate of perpetrators of sexual offense, improve relationships with different stakeholders in the fight against gender-based violence and sexual offenses, implement proactive measures against gender-based violence and sexual offenses. The department has planned training for the SAPS in addressing the GPV uh, victims so that then when police interact with uh, 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 victims and survivors, they do it in a manner that demonstrates Batupil. From the Department of Education, the public ordinary schools Learners uh, do access uh, a national school nutrition programs, and learners in public ordinary schools also benefit from the no fee school policy. When it comes to examination and education related uh, services, learners also are uh, doing well when it comes to the national uh, senior certificate. Grade 12 learners, so far we've seen majority of them uh, with ba uh, bachelor passes and others achieving 50% more in uh, mathematics. Uh, grade 12 also uh, do achieve 50% or more in physical uh, science. From the economic development, the cradle of humankind, which is a, a world heritage site, jobs uh, through it, jobs have been created through the cy cycling economy. There is uh, what, uh, what uh, people usually uh, collect and take for uh, uh, recycling. Jobs also are sustained uh, through the interpretation center at the Maruping and the Stagfontein Caves. Added in the, the Nukeng project, community project is, are supported through the Nukeng Game Reserve Community Development Trust. And the SMMEs are also supported non-financially by the, the Nukeng project. So in other words, they only offer them a training and skilling them, but they don't necessarily offer them any financial support. Cooperatives also are supported non-financially by the, uh, the Nukeng uh, uh, project. The Houghton Enterprise Propeller also, there are regional uh, operations where small enterprises are supported non-financially, like uh, including the hair saloons and spaza shops. Small enterprises also are supported through non-financial interventions in the priority street districts of Western and County and, and City Bank. So in other words, they only offer them training and show them how to deal with their finances, but they don't necessarily offer them any uh, money. Uh, informal businesses also are supported. Construction and tourism small enterprises also are supported. Manufacturing small enterprises are also supported. Small enterprises pro pro are provided through uh, mentorship and incubation, including those that are doing furniture and artisan trades. Uh, small enterprises are also uh, provided with grant funding. And SMMEs are also provided with financial support through the provisions of loans. Small enterprises are supported through off-take agreements with the GPG sector departments and the private sector. Gauteng Growth and Development Agency, it does support uh, township industries. And uh, as a result, Gauteng firms are, are assisted uh, specifically on training on export readiness, market and business intelligence. Gauteng suppliers also are meshed to infrastructure programs. 
Automotive Industry uh, Development Center. Unemployed people are trained in automotive skills. Companies contracted to the efficient to the efficiency improvement programs. The SMMEs also are upskilled at the township hubs, incubates within the parenting phase of the incubation programs, incubates within also hand holding phase of incubation programs, incubates graduating from the program and companies incubated at EKC uh, Lab. And the Gauteng Industrial Development Zone, uh, students are trained in construction skills program and the Constitution Hill market access opportunities are also created for creative and tourism SMMEs. Marketing opportunities are also provided to creative and tourism uh, SMMEs. Uh, we are asked to respond to a question on, our, on outlining plans to advance women's participation in the mainstream economy, particularly through small business opportunities, expanding employment opportunities for women in the province through targeted interventions at district level. The Department of Economic Development has the following programs and plans uh, in, to advance women participation. Firstly, they've got a mentorship program for women. In this mentorship uh, program, women enterprises are actually assisted to be potential uh, with potential business uh, ideas. Mentorship for existing women enterprises also to propel their businesses into the mainstream. Mentorship of women in the creative industries and also in manufacturers. Creative sector uh, job opportunities will be created in the poetry, theater, film, art, dance, design, and music sectors. Creative businesses will be provided with market access opportunity to, provi to profile their products, services, and linking them through to markets, through digital portal. Creatives also are supported through the implementation of Basha Uhur Creative, which is an uprising program through the procurement processes that also does happen uh, within the various departments. Through the business incubation program, we, women will be assisted to access funding, facilities, markets, and also will be provided with mentorship, training, and development skills in the 10 regional ECASIL uh, hubs. Export development readiness training will also be provided to women across all regions. Trade facilitation will also be conducted for women across all regions uh, in Gauteng. The Office of the Premier, the procurement spend, uh, what they do, they report on the analysis of the GPG-wide procurement spend on women-owned companies. They monitor the GPG departments on the implementation of the Gender-Based Violence Provincial Action Plan, reports on the alignment of targeted groups. Give you five GPG. more minutes to, to summarize. We'll Thank you very you much. Minutes. And economically excluded out of school, young people are also placed on pathways to earning including the CEPO 1 million uh, program and uh, our provincial gender machinery. Uh, the premier is the ultimate political authority responsible for the championing of the gender issues in the province. And all government departments have dedicated gender focal points and they've appointed them at senior management level and need the management. The provincial gender machinery also is chaired by the delegated uh, MEC, uh, whose name is Faith Mazibuko. The machinery also consists of departmental municipal focal points, civil society, organizations, legislature, gender and commission, uh, commission on gender equality, the LGBTQI uh, community plus labor. And it is a platform where they share best practices and joint planning with civil organization, and they report consistently on government uh, uh, performance. Um, let me uh, rush through to uh, in response to uh, the plan, the gender-based violence, uh, the national one, the national strategic plan, the provincial government has adopted a five-pillar program, which one, it is prevention of gender-based violence, strengthening the criminal justice, enhancing the legal and policy framework, provide adequate care support and healing for victims, introduce measures to provide the economy, economic, uh, um, uh, economic power for women uh, in Gauteng, and out of this plan, we take it from national and we make sure that uh, through the plan, there's education awareness, we register GPV cases, treatment and psychosocial support, assessment for SD and referral, healing and skills, exit after uh, the care. And we do have partnership with civil society, NGOs, and all other important uh, uh, people. We have already established all the provincial structures 
and they are working uh, very efficiently in ensuring that they monitor uh, the GPV. In conclusion, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, Chairperson of the NCOP, Gauteng recently launched what based GPVF brigades, which is a program that we launched in September. And these brigades are to ensure that each and every household is visited, there's education, there's uh, information sharing and referral of some of those cases. They're actually linked to police stations. So if they pick up a case, then they're able to refer that a case to the police station. We thank you very much for allowing Gauteng province to table its report. Thank you, Siabo. Thank you very much for the comprehensive report. I'm sure you have noticed that I have given you more time because we really want to understand the programs that are currently there so that we can also do proper oversight with the provincial legislature over the pro uh, programs. But thank you very much. We, we will be engaging with the, with the, uh, pr uh, the report after we have gotten the the reports from all three the provinces as well as from the the speaker's office in in Gauteng. We will now uh, go to Eastern Cape and we will call on Honorable Mani to Lucy to 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 present the report on the Eastern Cape province, the MEC for social development of, of the Eastern Cape. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to the Honorable Chair and the, and the Honorable Members. Honorable Chair, I'll be presenting the report on behalf of MEC Gomonye, who is the chairperson of the gender machinery in the province, who unfortunately this morning fell ill and could not be part of the session. But I know that she truly wanted to be here herself. The report from the province, and firstly, um, honorable chairperson, it indicates the key areas of focus for the mainstreaming of, of, of gender mainstreaming in the province, which include programs aimed at empowering women, advocacy campaigns on the rights of designated groups, as well as the building of capacity within the state to enable effective implementation of policies and legislative framework that advances the protection of and benefits women. Through the Office of the Status of Women, which is based in the Office of the Premier, there is also a focus on monitoring of the mainstreaming and socioeconomic inclusion of designated groups in all departments and municipalities. At the moment, all departments and municipalities in the province have functional SPUs, um, which are tasked with ensuring that the departmental plans accord with the protection of designated groups. Now, these SPUs um, also where gender focal points are located. This is further boosted by the departmental equity plans that assist in targeted recruitment of special groups. Um, Honorable Chair, in terms of the equity targets, currently out of our 13 departments, only three have met the 50% representation of women at SMAs. Those are the Department of Social Development, Human Settlement, and the Department of Rural Development and Agrarian Reform. The province does monitor the progress of departments in this regard on a quarterly basis. In the current PMTSF, and in pursuit of the outcome six of the MTST, which speaks to mainstreaming of gender, youth, and disability empowerment, the province has put in place specific interventions um, with targets over the MTSF period. Um, as an example, the following are included in the program of action for the PMTSF, the accessibility for persons with disabilities to public infrastructure and to equal opportunities, the procurement set aside for women, youth, and people with disabilities on SMEs. Lastly, the enabling of ease of access for designated group in public and private transport systems. 
Now, um, through the Department of Social Development, Women, Disability and Older Persons and Youth Development is budgeted 136.8 million, which is broken down on 33.6 million for our people living with disabilities, 88.3 for older persons, 11 million for youth development, and 3.9 million for you women development. Through the Extended Public Works Program, which is headed by the Department of Transport, the province has benefited 1,375 work opportunities for women in our rural areas and up to 33,904 on our EPWP um, work opportunities. And this is in this financial Part of SMME development, um, 319,751,000 million seven hundred and fifty one thousand worth of contracts have been awarded to women companies through the Department of Transport. Through our Department of Rural Development and Agrarian Reform, in the current financial year, support with infrastructure and production inputs in all our districts. These are targeting youth, women, and people with disabilities who are already in the poultry and pickery business and who are willing to produce for the market. In the current financial year, as part of the land reform beneficiary policy, the province has committed 2,000 farmers and 210 farm workers will be capacitated in primary agricultural production and agribusiness skills. And as such a side, a budget of 15.5 million that is targeting youth and farmer capacitation programs. The province um, honorable chair has also allocated 4.6 million to pilot rural training and market development targeting our out of school youth. Through the Department of Sports, Recreation, Arts and Culture, the province has made available 15 million in relief fund, which has benefited our young artists and sports people. The department has an internship program, which is allocated an amount of 962 million 304. And currently, there are five young interns in the program. And as part of its contribution to the EPWP program, the department has 160 young people employed for a period of 12 months. The total annual budget for this program is 4,342,000, with 2,122,000 from DESREC voted funds and the 2,122,000 from our Department of Public Works. The next phase of the mainstreaming is now beginning, where the focus is on gender responsive budgeting and planning, guided by the National Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. The province has started with the assessment of provincial plans to determine the extent of compliance with, um, with gender norms. At the moment, as the province, along with the rest of the country, we're focusing on the fight against the scourge of gender-based violence. The province is also playing its part in the implementation of all the pillars in the national strategic plan um, as, as, as implemented. Now, um, Honorable Chen, in this regard, our um, anti-GPV efforts are focusing on the national strategic plan with the, with the following pillars. One, um, accountability, coordination and leadership. Uh, two, prevention and rebuilding of social cohesion. Three, justice, safety, protection. Four, response, care, support and healing. Five, economic power. And the last one, research and information management. Now, the Office of the Premier, together with our Department of Social Development, Department of Safety and Lising, and DESREC, um, is coordinating the development of our integrated anti-GPV strategy, which focused on the following, the mainstreaming of the lessons from the GPV pilot in Mtata, linking the, our, the, the, the GPV emergency response plan to the national strategic plan, synchronizing all platforms and structures to eliminate duplication of efforts, facilitating the more involvement of our municipalities, 
Then particular focus at the moment is on the coordination of the streams of work that are seemingly running parallel, such as the national implementation of the NSP, the provincial implementation of the emergency response plan, our 100 days rapid response program, the OR Tambo GBV pilot implementation, and the pillar team's coordination of the NSP. Accordingly, the GBVF coordination team has been established consisting of OTP, social development, safety and licensing, and the UNFPA. The team does meet monthly ahead of the PSS working group and coordinates the customized Eastern Cape National um, Strategy Plan development. The revival of the gender machinery, which brings together justice, crime, and security cluster, departmental gender focal points, municipal SPUs, relevant NPOs in the province, et cetera, um, is serving as the GBV F coordination mechanism at the moment. The coordination includes working with the Rapid Results Institute, which is mandated by the presidency to address the key challenges within a 100-day period. These being the victim support and empowerment, safer schools and families, the Tutuzela care centers, the turnaround for cases and gender sensitive courts, the um, provision of DNA testing services. Now, other work, our other work includes the assessment of the gender responsive budgeting and planning compliance, which amongst others is focusing on the gender bias of government spending and plans in relation to the measuring results, measuring performance, resource consideration, infrastructure projects, public-private partnership, district development model. Now, um, Honorable Chair, as I stated earlier, the, 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 the gender disability is a challenge in the province. Out of the 13 departments, only three have met the target of representativity of women at SMS level. Now, the above, the, the, the above I think in the next slide, um, the table shows us how far each department versus March 2020 and the current um, status is fearing as far as the representativity of women at our SMS level. Now, this indicates that the public service policies and practice are not translating to the empowerment of women in the province that departments indeed should change their culture and be more responsive to the development of women in the, in the public service. Then the next slide, um, Honorable Chair, speaks to the, 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 the achievement of persons living with disability, their equity status across our departments, with only three departments that have met that quota, the Office of the Premier, the COCTA, the Department of Safety and Licensing, and all others, um, Honorable Chair, they, they fear far below the 2% the target of our persons living with disabilities. Um, with that, Chair, I present to you the report uh, from the gender machinery of the province of the Eastern Cape. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, MEC. Uh, is it the city, money, the, the city? Uh, thank you very much for the, also the concise, and even the fact that you go, you went to the to the extent of providing us with 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 budgets. We would love to have that uh, presentation to be sent to to the NCOP. Mzwandle indicated his his contact details on the on the platform. Uh, Honorable, uh, I, uh, can I give over to you to chair for the uh, the input of Ms. Kekana and then for the interactive. It's okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Can we then allow the Honorable Kekana to quickly take us through? Honorable Kekana? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And my apologies for the uh, glitches that I experienced uh, earlier. 
let me just greet you, Program Director and the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Sylvia Lucas, the Premier, Eastern Cape Province, Honorable Mabuyani, Premier of the Northwest oh. Province, Honorable uh, Mokoro, members of the Houghton Provincial Legislature, members of the Eastern Cape Legislature, members of the Northwest Legislature, the Chairperson of Commission for Gender Equality, uh, Ms. Matebula, Commissioner of the Financial and Fiscal Commission, uh, Mr. E. Rockman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. And I will be talking on strengthening the oversight and accountability, as well as the oversight role of the provincial legislature in advancing the implementation of gender equality commitments. Honorable members, uh, following the democratic elections of 1994, South Africa established a world-class legislative environment for transformation from a society characterized by racial and gender inequalities to a more equal, non-sexist, and non-racist society. While a young uh, democracy in the mid-90s and early 2000s, South Africa accelerated transformation, seeing achievements such as the representation of women in parliament from a mere 2.7% in 1994 to 41% in 2017 with female deputy ministers at 47%. However, following this rapid progress after 1994, it has been argued more recently that South Africa is experiencing a gender mainstreaming recession because instead of sustaining the transformation momentum built after 1994, there seems to be a relapse where inequality, poverty and unemployment amongst women and youth is going rampant while gender-based violence has become a pandemic. Furthermore, this gender mainstreaming recession has affected how the Houghton legislature scrutinizes the Houghton provincial government on its gender commitments for the province. The momentum of the mid nineties to mainstream gender and human rights was not sufficiently institutionalized and sustained. And in response, National Department of Women and has developed a gender responsive planning and budgeting framework to facilitate institutionalization and sustainability through mainstreaming gender and human rights in budgets. The department has also issued a declaration of the gender responsive planning and budgeting summit, which calls for the state entities to ensure that the mainstreaming of gender and human rights are institutionalized and sustained through gender responsive budgeting. In response to these gender responsive initiatives, the Houghton legislature has established and gendered policies over and above a gender policy, which it adopted in 2012. As part of facilitating the implementation of this policy, the institution developed the transversal mainstreaming policy and the sexual harassment policy. The transversal uh, mainstreaming policy, which was informed by an internal diagnostic study, outlines broad strategies to guide the GPL on mainstreaming gender and human rights in its mandates. It emphasizes areas of weaknesses and suggests approaches for addressing the weaknesses. It also outlines performance uh, measures to inform uh, planning roles and responsibilities and measures for accountability amongst others. The legislature also instituted various structures to serve as a uh, gender machineries, including um, one, the revival of the multi-party women's caucus and the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, known as the CWP, who champions and drives the agenda for mainstreaming gender and human rights in the constitutional mandates of the legislature and the administration uh, support services provided to, to committees. Uh, also the transversal mainstreaming focal point, which provides technical support to both the political and administrative wings of the legislature. It also established the men's forum who advocates for the slogan, not in our name. 
and supports the multi-party women's caucus gender mainstreaming interventions in the legislature. There's also the oversight committee on the premier's office and the legislature known as OPCOL, uh, which has always been an oversight entity in the legislature, which holds the GPL and the premier's office accountable on the implementation of gender transformation programs as well as the Houghton Speakers Forum, through which the Houghton Provincial Legislature supports municipalities on gender mainstreaming interventions and the establishment of their multi-party women's caucuses. These structures are amongst the gender machineries in the Houghton Legislature, which serves as a foundation for, the, for, for supporting the mainstreaming of cross-cutting issues in the legislature. In response to the sector oversight model of the South African legislative sector to oversee gender mainstreaming in the province, the Houghton legislature has put in place various interventions to improve its strategic and operational efficiencies as follows. One, establish a GPL internal assessment of mainstreaming gender, race, disability, and youth, which is known as the transversal mainstreaming audit and training project. It was conceptualized and executed in 2016-17 as a conscious effort to position the GPL to respond appropriately to commitments of the post-2015 transformation agendas. The project also sought to establish a systematic basis for planning and measuring the performance of the institution in mainstreaming issues of gender, race, youth, and disability. Furthermore, the project sought to explore ways to address challenges hindering the desired progress in mainstreaming gender and human rights. Project findings with extensive recommendations. The audit culminated into a report with extensive recommendations. One was to uh, on the development of transversal uh, mainstreaming training material. This material is a living document which can be consulted in ensuring that gender mainstreaming continues. And the material can also be used for the gender responsive budgeting training. It also contains practical tools for mainstreaming, including guidelines for planning, monitoring, and reporting guidelines for mainstreaming in the GPL mandates, administration support services, supply chain management, finance, human resources, and formats for compiling a uh, disaggregated data. Three, uh, also to conduct a, a blended training on gender responsive budgeting, which was conducted in collaboration with the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization. And those who were trained included both members and officials from the Houghton Legislature and the gender focal points personnel in the Houghton uh, government. The Houghton Legislature is proud to report that the above interventions have been completed. What is ongoing is the implementation of resolutions which emanated from this training. Specifically, this blended training on the transversal mainstreaming and gender responsive budgeting in the 2018-2019 financial year came as a directive of the Houghton Provincial Legislature Multi-Party Women's Caucus. Members of the caucus felt that there was a dire need for them to be upskilled on gender responsive budgeting. It is against this backdrop, background that a partnership was forged with the ITCILO through whom the gender responsive uh, budgeting component was incorporated into the internal transversal mainstreaming training, resulting in the blended mode of training. An implementation plan was agreed upon by participants in the training where short-term and long-term commitments were made. By virtue of their nature, some of the envisaged short and long-term interventions do overlap. And for the purposes of oversight and accountability, which is undertaken by committees of the House, the following resolutions are only related to the committees. One, uh, the short-term plans on committees, is to ensure that the committee planning is specific to also include oversight on gender responsive budgeting. And then the committee unit workshop on how to apply gender lenses in scrutinizing reports submitted by the executive. And uh, number two is on the long-term uh, long uh, reports, uh, long-term uh, commitments 
on for committees. That is, they must ensure that uh, analysis and integration of uh, gender mainstreaming and gender responsive budgeting in committees uh, included in their plans and reports. And also ensure that the main